I'm half Lebanese, so being on hormones, um, I got really hairy. Do you want a dead daughter or a living son? Here's the path we have laid out. Um, if we don't follow it, there's a very good chance that your child will commit suicide. Despite if you question this at all, you get labeled really quickly, correct? You do, immediately as transphobic. Why do you think that is? I think the point, Harmy and Chloe, sorry, it's like the cigarette companies. They knew what they were doing, but they pushed it anyway for money and yep. for, you know, for, you know, for branding and so forth. You've been a boy and a girl. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess. <laughs> After going public with her detransition story, she discovered an online community of 5,000 in a similar position. 30 people alone in her area of Newcastle. Ellie is Patrick's mother. She moved to London with him a month ago to give him a fresh start. But before he goes to school here in England, she's taking drastic action to have her young son's breasts surgically reduced. Take you on that when you were little yeah, and <laughs> Ali wants to warn other parents what can go wrong when doctors misdiagnose a child as transgender. They were wrong to pigeonhole him so quickly. I think they should have said, here we have a child who does have gender dysphoria and he's going through a period of transition where he needs to work out exactly how he feels. I think we have to acknowledge there are a lot of children who are confused about their gender uh, identity as, as a normal phase that they would go through. It's not uncommon to be confused. The good news is they're going to grow out of it. Don't mess them up. Sydney paediatrician Professor John Whitehall says the numbers of children being treated with gender dysphoria in Australia are currently skyrocketing. It's a condition where a person is born one gender, but in their mind, they're another. You don't accept that the true levels of gender dysphoria are as high as appear to be being diagnosed at the moment? No, I don't. I've never seen it, and I think it's much rarer than the current reports would suggest. Single mum, Ali Mitchell, has always known her little boy was different. Even when he was young, three and four, he would dress up in girls' clothes. And at one stage he did say to me that could he be taken to the doctor to be made into a girl. At first, Ali dismissed it as just a phase. But when Patrick turned 12, he made a startling confession that turned both their lives upside down. He said to me that, yes, I really identify as a girl and I don't feel like the boys around me. So it was at that point that I said to him, well, we need to take some expert advice on this. Was it a relief to be able to tell her? Yeah, definitely. And at that stage, did you believe that you were a girl in a boy's body? Yes. What does it feel like? Um, well, it just feels like um, you wish you could just change everything about you. You just see any girl and you say, I'd kill to be like that. No. It came as an even greater relief when Patrick was diagnosed with gender dysphoria by doctors in Adelaide. With mum's support, Patrick made the full-time transition to life as a girl. It's regular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that no child would do this on a whim. It's one of the most harrowing, stressful, um, self-questioning um, experiences you can have. All right, joining us now is one of the detransitioners you just saw in that piece, uh, Luca. In terms of people understanding your situation, do you believe that your predicament of deciding whether or not transitioning was right for you was about the process that got you into it, or was it that you had a change after transition? 
Um, I think it really came from the fact that I, since I transitioned so young, I just kind of, I grew up and I matured a bit more. And I really like thought about my future in ways that I was just not capable of at the time of like the medical interventions. Like I, I thought about like, do I want biological children? And I kind of had like an oh shoot moment because I realized what could have been done there and that I could have really damaged that chance along with just like, like I said, really just getting older and growing up a little bit more and being able to actually process what these feelings were and where they originally came from and like deal with stuff like my dysphoria and my depression and any other issues I had in a more mature way that in the long term I think will be better. Your parents, speaking as a parent, they were very much, uh, tell me if this is true, encouraged by the clinician that, hey, if you want to help your kid, you need to get down this road as far as you can, as fast as you can. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, they were, they were told the fairly common line that I feel like parents hear now that, do you want a dead daughter or a living son? Um, pretty much like, well, you're, here's the path we have laid out. Um, if we don't follow it, there's a very good chance that your child will commit suicide, despite the fact that I did maintain throughout the entire thing that I was never suicidal. They still were pushed to believe that. What do you think that was about? I like to think that there is like a genuine sense of care in wanting to protect kids from being suicidal and like protect them from themselves if they are suicidal. But this can't be the right way to funnel kids that are like confused with their body or their gender down a course where at least in my case, it very quickly turned to medical intervention. Ruby began identifying as male at 13 years old. Now 21, she'd been planning to have surgery to remove her breasts. But in May, she made the decision to come off testosterone and detransition to identify as female, her sex at birth. She doesn't want to be identified, so we've changed her name. I figured it would be better for me to try to deal with my gender dysphoria in a different way rather than um, permanently changing my body. How much support did you feel was out there for you when you came to this conclusion? I didn't feel like there was any support out there other than like a few friends online. Ruby now feels her eating disorder was more of a factor than she first realised in her gender dysphoria. None of the therapists that I spoke to um, brought that up. They didn't think that it was linked. Do you? I think so, yes, because it they're both kind of based in how I feel about my body, so I've seen similarities between the two. Charlie Evans is forming a charity to support people in Ruby's position. After going public with her detransition story, she discovered an online community of 5,000 in a similar position, 30 people alone in her area of Newcastle. I was approached by a young woman um, with a beard and she hugged me and, and said, like, I'm, I'm a detransitioned woman as well, I've just stopped taking testosterone. Um, and after that, I felt like I had to do something. I'm hearing from like, hundreds of people, um, and I think some of the common characteristics are they tend to be around their mid-20s. Um, they're mostly female and mostly same-sex attracted, most are lesbians, um, and often autistic as well. The Tavistock and Portman NHS Trust told us the experience of regret described here is extremely rare. Their gender identity service for children in Leeds and London now has a record number of referrals. The clinics here and in London see 3,000% more patients than they did 10 years ago. Among girls, referrals are up more than 5,000%. There's no question this service is helping children who feel distressed in their own bodies. But the full impact of children making decisions about their gender at such young ages may not truly be clear.
until much later in their lives. I was born biologically female. I began transitioning and taking hormones when I was 18 years old. Growing up, I couldn't pinpoint what my issues were, and then I realized that it might be a gender issue. When I turned 18, I did go to Planned Parenthood. I just stated that I had gender dysphoria, and they gave me testosterone a week later. Before I went on hormone therapy, I wasn't required to see any therapist or any sort of a doctor at all. So about a year and a half after I was on hormones, I decided to see a therapist about getting approval for top surgery. I walked in on one appointment for half an hour, and then she emailed my insurance for approval, just like that. Even at this point, when I was passing as a man, I still had these doubts in the back of my mind that said, what if you're wrong? What if you made a mistake? In the end, I decided not to do the surgery. At that point that I decided to detransition and live my life as a woman again. Even as an adult, it took me a long time to figure out who I was and who I wanted to be. Kids especially need to see a therapist before making any sort of permanent medical decisions like going on hormone blockers and surgeries especially. I mean, they don't even know what they want for dinner the next day, let alone what gender they are. The biggest mistake that I made was that I did not get the right amount of therapy or medical advice needed. These days, if you tell a parent if their child thinks that they might be transgender or has gender dysphoria, to wait and really consider it and maybe seek other therapy, you're just seen as transphobic now because you're not accepting people. I'm not anti-trans at all. I support the trans community very much, but I also support medical responsibility. It is well known that 80% up to even up to 85% of children who experience gender dysphoria and cross-sex identification feel differently when they reach puberty, after the early phases of puberty. And therefore, any medical interventions are not recommended to prepubertal children. Well, this from one of Finland's leading experts on pediatric gender care. And it should be a wake-up call to all of America. But let's face it, the demonic freaks who are pushing kids into life-altering procedures they don't care that 85% of them would eventually just grow out of their fixation. In fact, that's probably why these freaks want to push these surgeries onto kids at a younger and younger age. Get them young, and then the damage is done. Which is why in Finland you can't perform these irreversible surgeries on kids at all. But here in the United States you can, and this sexual brainwashing happened to my next guest, who underwent a double mastectomy at age 15. At age 17, Chloe changed her mind and detransitioned, and today she decided to fight back, filing a groundbreaking lawsuit against Kaiser and the doctors who she says performed a sex change experiment on her. Chloe Cole joins me now along with her attorney, Harmeet Dillon. Chloe, um, what's your message to parents out there? who may have been told their son or daughter has gender dysphoria. Thank you, Laura, for having me. Um, my message to parents right now is, unfortunately, you might have to go against the advice of your doc the doctors right now and to keep your kids away from this ideology, to keep them away from this experimentation while also letting them know that you love them and staying as involved in their lives as you can. Harmi, we reached out to Kaiser Permanente uh, in the statement that they gave us, read in part, that the care decisions always rest with the patient and their parents. And in every case, we respect the patients and their families' informed decisions about their personal health. Harmi, is that really the case? Well, see, that's the lie, Laura. Informed is the trick word there. And it is in impossible for any patient who goes to get care of this nature at Kaiser to, to give informed consent because Kaiser isn't telling the whole story to patients like Chloe. In fact, they're pushing this surgery on children at younger and younger ages. And to be very clear, it's both woke ideology and it's big business. They're signing up children for a lifetime of medical care and treatment and a lifetime of regret for most of them, as you just mentioned from that expert in Finland, and that is what studies show. And, you know, it is selling a lie that you can change your gender. That's a lie. And it is selling this mimicry, and it is also pushing drugs on children with a false premise that puberty blockers are reversible. They are not, and they have lifetime effects on children that are unknown. 
And so it is a package of lies, and frankly, it is impossible to give informed consent under these circumstances. That is why we're holding, seeking to hold Kaiser and the physicians and medical professionals who did this to Chloe liable so that, first of all, she gets the care she needs for the rest of her life. And second of all, mm. Kaiser thinks twice before doing this to other children. Being really depressed and not knowing why I feel the way that I do and having no motivation for life, um, just unhappy, I think. And I don't think it was necessarily because I transitioned. I think I was just really confused. <laughs> I was 16, I had come out as bisexual and I started dating someone when I was 17 who then came out to me as trans. Um, this was the first person that I had ever met that was trans that I knew of. When they would describe some of their feelings or things that they went through, um, some of those things resonated with me. Not everything, but some things. And it made me kind of question that. Um, and they could have been as like little as things as like, I was a big tomboy when I was younger um, and liked playing with the boys or playing, um, you know, different sports or wearing boys clothes um, to feeling uncomfortable with my chest, like during puberty, you know, things like that. But then there were other things that I didn't resonate with. Like I didn't think that, oh, I should have been born a male or um, I've always been a boy. I just acknowledged my masculine energy um, and I just didn't know how to express it really. Going on hormones, I mean, that was like a very um, positive decision for me. I was able to acknowledge my masculinity how I wanted to um, and be perceived in a little bit of a different way instead of this, you know, soft, feminine person. I had a lot of gender euphoria. I was very happy. I felt very positive. I felt confident, comfortable, all of these things. And I had a very androgynous look still at the time, which was great for me. As I started to progress in my transition still taking hormones my body just continued to get more and more masculine and that was a fuller beard that was more body hair that was my voice getting even more deeper and i started to feel a little uncomfortable i didn't understand why i felt uncomfortable because i had made all of these really amazing decisions and i felt really good in all of those decisions so why why am i unhappy why am i uncomfortable working a lot. I was just hang like, you know, partying with friends, hanging out, traveling. I was just doing a lot of wild, spontaneous things and trying to find happiness. And when the pandemic hit, I was completely alone. And I just sat with my feelings and I had told myself, I don't want to feel this way anymore. I don't want to be depressed. I don't want to look in the mirror and not like who I am. I was sitting at home one day and I just was like, I don't have to be on hormones for the rest of my life. It was like this idea that just popped up in my head. Like I had never thought about it before or something. It was really odd. 